when Ali was <laughs> like, where's this information coming from? Sources, I said curtly. I spend too much time on TikTok. Immediately, it was like, are these sources in the room with us? <laughs> I love it. I love them so much. I love them so much. I'm almost done, by the way. This will be the last chapter that I read, definitely. We will get into Darkles and Sanity. Tomorrow, as you can see, I am yawning. I've been up since 7.30 on a Saturday. This is the last thing I will read, but I've ranted enough. I've ranted enough. I am already scared about how long this video is going to be, but... I mean, I'm sorry. This is the era for vlogs. I don't even mind if you don't see them. In fact, I don't even care because <laughs> this is more of an outlet than it is a commercial success. I have two editions of this book, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have two editions of this book, by the way. I have like this one and the other red one. You know, if you saw my bookshelf tour any of the years, I wanted to read this one. It's too nostalgic for me. Like this is the original that I bought, that I read, that I abused. I love it. But the other one has the Darkling short story. So I was like, I want to tap the other one because it, it's the material that like really smudges when you hold it. But who am I going to lend this out to anyway? I don't like lending out my books. No one ever, ever, ever takes care of them. So I'll just read this one. I didn't even tap it up. It's like four taps, if you can see, for like basically the Darkling scenes. The blue one is his death. I marked that the first time that I read it, or rather the second time. The first time I was too busy crying into a pillow at eight in the morning. <laughs> but I just wanted to clarify that. This is how much we read. It's about halfway through. Actually, yeah, about halfway through. I will see you tomorrow. Why am I saying this? It's no break to you. You might not be able to tell because because I'm using the exact same outfit, but that's just my home outfit. It's the next day, actually, right now. It's like 5 p.m. This is exactly why it's important that he doesn't reveal his name to anyone because when she says it to Bagra, it actually carries weight. Like, it carries weight that he told her that and Bagra will now actually tell her about Morozova and about their family history. In the show, it physically hurt me when they were going out riding and he was just like, call me Alexander. And I was like, no, no, absolutely not. It's it's one of those tropes that's like, if you know a thing's name, you have power over it. He consciously gave her that specific power over him. And it, I hate it. I hate it how they handled it. But let's not talk about the show anymore. Because she's talking to Bagra now. And that's probably the best part of the book in terms of Bagra. <laughs> Because they're actually, again, the thing I love most about Alina and the Darkling is that though she absolutely needs to bring him down, she isn't, like, she doesn't hate him. She still, she's the only person in the world who somewhat understands him, so she doesn't talk about him in terms of hating him. She was, she's always like, we need to bring him down, so help me. She tells Bagra his true name, and she's like, he'll be lost forever. And then she's gonna finally tell them of Morozova. I, it's painful. It's painful. When Bagra dies and the whole thing, it's painful. But I just love book three so much. I love book three so much because Alina, as a protagonist, has been great from the beginning. But this is the first time that we actually see her real power as a person and as a Grisha who has grown up and has started behaving intelligently. Like, I will compare it to Vasya because book three Vasya is kind of like book three Alina. They both came into their own power and know how to use it. And I, I love that. I will dive into this story and you know I will. I'll tell you a story, one I used to tell a little boy with dark hair, a silent boy who rarely laughed, who listened more closely than I realized, a boy who had a name and not a title. She writes like a master when it comes to the Morozovas, we have to acknowledge that, like, obviously this was her most honed book in the trilogy, and it should be, but as soon as she gets into their backstory, she's like a poet. <laughs> Bagra's story itself, like, putting the darkling aside is so sad on its own because it's like 
I am Morozova's daughter, and the Darkling is the last of Morozova's line. My mother was terrified of me. It's awful. Like, the whole thing is just awful for the both of them. Years had passed, hundreds, maybe a thousand, but I recognized the hurt in her voice. The sting of always feeling underfoot and unwanted. I tried to make myself useful, but all I did was annoy him, and eventually he banned me from his wor workshop. And the fact that she cut her sister in two, like, bestie, I love Baga. I love her so much. But the hypocrisy, I think, isn't really lost on her. Like, she was what created her son. Like, literally and metaphorically, she created who her son now is. But she's kind of sometimes hypocritical about it. And that, I think, makes it even more heartbreaking. Because now she's like, he's doing atrocities, but I made him do the atrocities. But sometimes when she's talking to them, it kind of sounds like she isn't necessarily taking the responsibility for it. I might be talking about the show. Because the, whole, the only thing I watched in season two was the Darkles and... <laughs> and his mom and in the show they definitely make it seem like she's being hypocritical and like he she isn't owning up to the responsibility of who they both are and what she taught him so it might in, in my mind it might be mixing with the show but i love them both i love them both i would have an entire book about them through the ages it would be fascinating <laughs> can we also like discuss how much she actually shielded him like everything that happened in demon of the wood was traumatizing enough for him who knows how many other things like that kept happening but she shielded the crap out of him as a child obviously it gave him the ego and the superiority complex but she protected him because when she caught her sister all alina says is I try not to picture it, but the image rose up sharp in my mind. A muddy field, a dark-haired little girl, her favorite toy in pieces. She'd thrown a tantrum, as children do, but she'd been no ordinary child. Exactly. Like, exactly. Imagine having that much power that you can kill your sister accidentally when she slights you. I mean, she was lonely and very hurt, so it's a bit stronger than just children rivalry, but imagine having that power. And the people who are supposed to help you, like, it's two ends of the spectrum. Her parents didn't know what to do with her, so they just let her fester to the point of killing her sister. They could have just, you know, loved her, given her attention, not treated them any differently. And then you have her with her own son doing the exact opposite, treating him like he's better than everyone. Like, he will always be alone. He will always be the most powerful. He deserves the world. No one deserves him. Like, giving him a very, very strong superiority complex because she thought that would be better than what she got, which was a strong inferiority complex. The truth is, again, in the middle. I, I love the nuance that she gave these two. I really, really do. Barbara Handel's talking about, <laughs> about having her son is honestly iconic like honestly genuinely iconic because it's like but what about his father you want a love story too there's none to be had i wanted a child so i sought out the most powerful grisha i could find he was a heart render i don't even remember his name <laughs> honestly a queen a queen she was like well i want a child so <laughs> so how do we do this an icon a queen the moment i love her and here come the saddest and simultaneously the best quotes in this book <laughs> i gave him his pride i burdened him with ambition but the worst thing i did was try to protect him you must understand even our own kind shunned us feared the strangeness of our power there are no others like us i never wanted him to feel the way i had as a child so i taught him that he had no equal that he was destined to bow to no man i wanted him to be hard to be strong i taught him the lesson my mother and father taught me to rely on no one that love fragile and fickle and raw was nothing compared to power. He was a brilliant boy. He learned too well. I just... The, the poet, the literary genius in her, jumps out as soon as she talks about them. See, I cannot stop talking about it. I've Five clips have been wasted just on this one talk with Bagra, but I remember the hold it had on me the first time I read it. The hold it has on me now is much the same because it's still just as strong. Nothing in, in these books resonates with me as much as the two of them do. But that's obviously just personal preference. 
and the reality of what she says. He probably took his own life. It's the way most Grisha of great power die. Why? Do you think I never contemplated it, that my son didn't? Lovers age, children die, kingdoms rise and fall, and we go on. Maybe Morozova is still wandering the earth, older and more bitter than I am. Or maybe he used his power on himself and ended it all. It's simple enough. Like calls to like. I love it. The fact that she thinks she might be related to the Darkling. <laughs> so she's like, <laughs> I almost, I almost did incest. <laughs> no, your boyfriend is, but... I know it's like fantasy coincidence that Mal happens to be the descendant of Baga's sister. <laughs> but the fact that she's like, what if I'm the descendant and I almost did it? <laughs> we stand a queen. That's exactly what I was I would first think of. I'd be like, I'm the first sun summoner in God knows how long. What if I'm related to the guy I almost hooked up with? Like, oh my god. We love a queen. I'd honestly kill myself if I had to spend a night like that with Nikolai. I'd just throw myself off, off the bridge or what, whatever, wherever they are. <laughs> but when she's like, he took my hand, circling my bare wrist with his fingers. I tensed and realized I was waiting for the rush of surety that came with the Darkling's touch. Or a jolt like the one I'd felt that night at the little palace when Mal and I had argued by the banya. Nothing happened. <laughs> I love her so much. I love her so- exactly my point. He was never an option. She's like, the Darkling, like, matches my power. Mal matches me as a person. The Nikolai does nothing. <laughs> my queen and my icon. I- I stand. Like, I literally stand. I love her. I'm gonna eat now, but the fact that she's like- when she when Nikolai tries to kiss her, she's like, Well maybe love is something you're not supposed to have, something you're never going to reach. <laughs> I I can't. Like she is in her mind, she is just roasting him so hard. And he everything he says cringes through my entire body. Like the fact that she tells him something he told her and he's like, I love it when you quote me, die. Bomb him airstrike <laughs> like that tiktok sound i <sighs> my blood just boils anytime nikolai shows up soon he will be in pain though because he will be struck by the nichevoya which i don't want to enjoy but you know i will the absolute disrespect that the dark look is showing for nikolai is sending me <laughs> Ah, the pirate prince. I've regretted many of the things I've had to do in this war, said the Darkling. This is not one of them. <laughs> oh, I love him. I love him so much. <laughs> that would be me. That would literally be me. I'd be like, all of this death is unfortunate. This one is not, though. <laughs> I, I, I know I'm supposed to take all of this seriously. This is my first time reading it. I'm allowed to find things funny. <laughs> What hurts me immensely is that with Bagra and Alexander, cruelty is a currency. Like, it doesn't mean anything bad. It's just a currency. He cut out her eyes for the betrayal, and they still treat each other the same. <laughs> because when he sees Bagra, she's, he's like, go back inside. My soldiers will not harm you. Like, after everything, he's like, he doesn't want her dead. In his brain, it doesn't even click that there would be a world without his mother. And she knows that, one, she can't live anymore. <laughs> she has had enough. But two, she needs to shake him in that way. She needs to see that they're not... She needs to show him that they're not permanent and that he can't always rely on her being there so her death is the one thing in this story that rattles him insanely like he goes feral when she actually dies even though he like ordered her eyes removed like they're kind of sick but also very loving bond is one of the more powerful things in this book because essentially they're the only characters who are not children <laughs> Like, all of the other main characters are children maybe 20 years old. Darkles and Bagra are both, like, <clears throat> a millennia old. They're the only ones who are not actually children. And they have forged their odd relationship through centuries. And 
it always hurts me so much when he has to experience losing the one person in the world who actually truly understood him it, it's pain it's pain like he comes here he knows she's here and he's angry but he's like stay back my soldiers won't harm you i hate it here when the darkness monsters just come to hug her they know me these children like calls to like stop this demanded the darkling she shared the darkling's blood his power would she act against him now i will not fight you the darkling said then strike me down you know I won't. She smiled then and gave a little chuckle as if she were pleased with a precocious student. It's true. That's why I still have hope. I'm just in pain. <sighs> because I know she's about to die. I'm in pain. I can't. <laughs> they were, exact, exactly as Lena says in the end, they were burdened by too much power. Not Neither of them deserved this. But they reeked so much terror because they didn't deserve this it's a horrible paradox but one that works very well in fantasy experience the pain of this together you earned those eyes he said coldly though i heard the hurt there too i did she said with a sigh and more know that i loved you she said to the darkling know that it was not enough in a single movement, she shoved herself up on the wall, and before I could draw breath to scream, she tipped forward and vanished over the edge, trailing the Nichevoya behind her in tangled skeins of darkness. No, the Darkling roared. He dove after her, the wings of his shoulders beating with fury. <sighs> I, I just can't. I can't. Nichevoya streamed past us, pulled towards the terrace by Bagra's trailing skeins. Others simply hovered in confusion as their master drew further away. The fact that it, we've never seen him have genuinely this strong of a reaction. And I love that, in a way. I think here, both he and Alina somehow realized that they would never be that. <clears throat> they would never be that. They would never share that the way... <laughs> the two monsters, even among Grisha, did. And after this, he becomes ruthless towards her. Absolutely, unapologetically ruthless and cruel and just very, very, very self-destructive, but taking everyone down with him. So in the end, when she loses the power and he is the last one in the world, he lets her kill him and he's like... This is just not good. I can't live like this. He, I just remember his very, very, very heartbreaking realization that, like, you're gone now, too. All of the power that equals mine in this world is gone. I can't live like this. <laughs> I can't live like this. And that's the very haunting aspect of a villain who's just truly, truly alone. This is exactly what I love about Alina and exactly what I said three times in this video because she comprehends who the darkling is as a person without justifying anything because she's like if i thought of nikolai i would fall apart or bagra or the broken pieces of sergey's body or stig left behind or even the darkling the look on his face as his mother disappeared beneath the clouds how could he be so cruel and still so human and how she mentions both him and bagra when she's talking about ravka making orphans of them all Exactly. Exactly. All of it started because of someone else. But that's, <laughs> that's in general how society works. So the whole this country made monsters of us all is just such a cool message. Probably the last moment that the tether isn't deeply malevolent, but I felt it then. The vibration along the invisible tether. I pushed away from it. I would not go to the Darkling now. I wouldn't go to him ever again. But still, I knew wherever he was, he was grieving. See? <laughs> I remember the first time I read this. Almost as vividly as I remember reading Red Queen. Some experiences just stick with you. I ate up every mention of the Darkling in this book. And I... I feel like every time I read one of those lines, I vividly remember memorizing all of them, like knowing 
almost every line about him in this book. <laughs> so yeah, it's just all deeply nostalgic for me. What must it be like for people who actually waited for these to be released? That must have been quite the experience. I'm very happy that for all of my favorite books, I magically got to them and got interested in them right after they were all published. But that's all intentional because I hate waiting for books. <laughs> I have a thought that someone has probably already had in this fandom. I just need to voice it. If Morozova's daughters are both amplifiers and their children are also amplifiers and he never touched the Firebird, does that mean that he that maybe him and his wife couldn't have children so he did it on purpose or did he on purpose make his daughters amplifiers because we obviously know the importance of the resurrected daughter being an amplifier because that makes Mal the third Morozova amplifier but Darkles and his mother are also amplifiers but for some reason not considered one of the three? I mean, probably, to be fair, because the legend didn't grow from them. Like, they concealed themselves while Morozova's legend grew elsewhere. Wherever he went with his daughter, that's where the legend grew. And people documented the three amplifiers. But I'm just wondering if he made his daughters the amplifiers on purpose and all the generations that come from them also amplifiers because if you think about it Bagra or the Darkling's bones are definitely an equivalent to the other three like equivalent to Mal and the other stuff which is why she can't really rival the Darkling with the same amplifiers that he was made of like if that makes sense in order to get amplifiers that equal him a living amplifier she has to kill three of them so obviously she can't rival it because he's a living one this is like a bit of a rant that i'm not sure makes complete sense but my point is we never really discuss if morozawa making both of his daughters amplifiers and all of their descendants also amplifiers was on purpose or not I mean, the fact that the the Darkling and Bagara are amplifiers is kind of ignored. Except for the short story and the first book when he keeps pulling out her power by doing that. But the fact that they're both amplifiers is kind of ignored after book one. Like, if I were Alina, I would have talked to her at length about that and being like, um, Bagara, if you're an amplifier and your son is an amplifier, is there a possibility that your sister was one? That if she had children, maybe there were other ones? Like why are you two amplifiers? I would have a very realistic conversation about that. Like, you two are literally Morozova's amplifiers. It's just interesting to me how that aspect of the two of them being one doesn't really come into play in, in an important way. Here's the thing. This is where my main gripe since book one comes out. But not completely. It's not completely a gripe. It's just a personal gripe. I thought of the dream the Darkling had once had, that we might be Rovkins and not just Grisha. He tried to make a safe place for our kind, maybe the only one in the world. I understand the desire to remain free. I get it's very common in fiction to make the villains good guys who just took the wrong route. Like, his plan, his dream, everything he wants to do is good. But he's going about it the wrong way. It's, it's sort of like one of those things that's like, I agree with everything the villain is doing, but do they have to commit genocide alongside it? But I think in this book, the, the villain might not have been that well chosen, which is why I actually prefer villains in six of crows because they're kind of on a level with the heroes here the insanity to follow aside the darkling's goal like should have been every grisha's goal from the get-go like the minute that alina found out what he wants to do she should have wanted to join him like throw down the king who is insane and a rapist and 
let Grisha have the freedom and not just serve as soldiers and sentry and essentially to protect this horrible king. Like from the beginning, his plan should have resonated with every single Grisha and then we could have had like a corruption arc where, where Alina had joined him and they had all been on his side and worked with him. But along the road, he proved to be really power hungry or he was corrupted or he realized that he doesn't just want to kill the king he wants to kill all people you know i think there should have been like a bit more development to him as a villain but that's what i said with book one book one didn't really feel like book one it felt like a very contained attempt at a story and then it expanded so i don't think she really realistically could have done it but in terms of potential the darkling isn't the best villain because of how sympathetic he is like he doesn't do anything hilariously bad until he does like his plan is sound motivate motivationally like correct but then all of a sudden he just kills random people without caring if they're grisha or not like you know what i mean i feel like it, it could have been an interesting thing if for the first two books the king was the villain and they all worked together like it was grisha versus humans to fight him but then in the last book they had to fight the Darkling because they'd won and they realized that it's not enough for him and he realizes that it's not enough for him. And then after all the Grisha band together, then there's strife among them, like Ruin and Rising Ruin, even among their own ranks. And they have to take down the Darkling even though they were his allies thus far. I feel like it would have been, it had more emotional weight if they didn't just reject his very good plan <laughs> from the get-go. That's something that always kind of bothers me in young adult because you want to have a very intelligent villain with a good plan, but you make them evil from the get-go. Like, make it at least realistic that the main characters support them at first and then stop supporting Like, Well, like what she did with Genya, only with Alina because she is the main character and her perspective is the one that we follow. What we do with Genya, who genuinely followed him and believed in his idea and then just defected and then seeing it all unravel from there. I just think it would have been way more interesting if he wasn't the main villain all along because I just don't think he's good enough of a villain <laughs> because the bad things that he does are very few and far between and whenever we see him talking... He's actually very rational and we agree with what he's talking about. So it's kind of like, you don't hate him. You don't really like him. You support him, but then he blows something up. You're, he's a very confusing villain character. I think he really could have worked better as a developing anti-hero, let's say, and then making the royal family the villains. Because in this entire story, the whole point is that the Grisha are used and abused and not in the best standing in this world. So I think that would have been way more interesting to explore than just taking down a very generic bad guy. <laughs> if Mal is tracking all the amplifiers because he is one himself, shouldn't the Darkling and his mother have been able to find them so long ago? This is exactly the gripe I had in my last rant, and as far as I'm aware, it's never explained why Mal is the only one who can find them, considering they're all from the same family, and both of them are also amplifiers. They should have been able to find them ages ago. But let's not get into it. I'm not here about the plot holes. I'm here about the nostalgia and the vibes. The thing that I love that Alina understands, but Mal doesn't, is that she is like the Darkling, except like the current Darkling, not not the old one, the old one who trusted everyone to the point of almost being bludgeoned to death by his peers, because he tells her, tell me something, would the Darkling ever have forgiven Genya or Toya and Tamara or Zoya or me? He would have, just a very, very long time ago. He doesn't have a duality, and rightfully so, that Alina does. <laughs> she knows who he was, and she knows who he is now and why, which is why when she compares herself to him, it's not quite the same as Mal. Because all he sees is like, oh, so you're genocidal as well? No, you're not, Alina. And she's just like, that's not exactly what I mean. <laughs> I still love him, though. I still love him because he's doing his best for her. So 
we we love him in this house <laughs> the one thing that again i need to question is you're telling me they knew each other all their lives and only twice <laughs> they've kissed i'm pretty sure they've kissed only once he touched her in a way that made her notice he was an amplifier like okay fine fine she didn't technically have her magic for half her life except she was grisha she just buried it so let's say that that's realistic even though as soon as she came back to camp the darklings amplifying ability worked very well but you're telling me that in all these months weeks that they've been all camping together moving together that she hugged him once too they've not once touched in a way that would make her notice he's an amplifier also, if he's an amplifier only when, yeah, he was with Zoya, so she would notice if he was an amplifier, which means he's an amplifier only for her. Like, it's a little bit of a stretch just because Lee wanted one last, like, sacrificial plot device, <laughs> which worked well. Let's be realistic. Might, might have worked even better if he wasn't revived. But it just feels like a bit of a stretch. It feels like a bit of a stretch. Like, in this specific moment, he is revealed to be an amplifier and to no one else. And never before. Like, again. The cycle had been completed. He'd endowed his daughter with the power he'd meant for the firebird. The circle had closed. But Bagra was one, too. And again, it's like we forget this fact after book one for some reason we forget that she's also an amplifier and so is her son i feel like that should be a very important part of the puzzle whether that was intentional or not because if he could only create the amplifiers by dabbling into merzost and using resurrection essentially then how was his other child one which begs the question did he magically create the child in his wife maybe they couldn't have a child so he did it through magic which is also creating life unnaturally which means that the other daughter and her progeny are also amplifiers but we never talk about this <laughs> we never talk about this so now i'm just speculating but i'm very very curious about this and if lee ever explained it somewhere i would love to know <laughs> the fact that as soon as she heard he marked in Karamsin, she was like, I am going to hunt that bitch down. But since she now has control over the tether, he can't exactly come to her. I can just imagine him sitting there, <laughs> waiting for her to find out and being like, ah, oh. and then trying to be cool when she finally shows up. Like, it's so funny to me. <laughs> I launched myself across the tether, seeking him. The only thought in my mind, what have you done? At last, the Darkling said, I don't know. <laughs> leaning against like he turned to me his beautiful face coming into focus he was leaning against the scorched mantle its outline was sickeningly familiar like i'm just I, I shouldn't be laughing i shouldn't be laughing but the, the fact that he was like probably waiting there and then he was like ah she's pulling up the tether let me lean against the windowsill and look absolutely nonchalant as if I wasn't waiting for her to pull up the tether after she found out what i did ah alina at last you have come <laughs> I, stuff about like that that you don't really think about in the moment is so funny to me. His gray eyes were empty, haunted. Was it Bugger's death that had left him this way or some horrific crime he'd committed here? I can't. I'm laughing too much for this scene. This is supposed to be serious. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't. I've been here for days, he said, leading me through the wreckage, over the piles of debris, through what had once been the entry hall, waiting for you. <laughs> He's been here for days, lounging in ash and wreckage, just to make this dramatic moment more dramatic. I can't. I. The dramatic flair of villains is a trope that will never die, because it's just too good. <laughs> I think this is also the true strength and sadness of the whole interaction. How can you do this? Don't you feel any of it? I have lived a long life, rich in grief, which, speaking of, I would like to see. 
My tears are long since spent. If I still felt as you do, if I ached as you do, I could not have borne this eternity. Where are you, Alina? I felt sure you would come to me when I moved against West Ravka. I thought your conscience would demand it. I could only hope that this would draw you out. Where are they? They are safe. For now. No, but these these, these bloody quotes. <laughs> these people, they were inner, innocent. I have waited hundreds of years for this moment, for your power, for this chance. I have earned it with loss and with struggle. I will have it, whatever the cost. What loss and what struggle? I really want to know. I really, really want to know. <laughs> there will be nothing left. No, he said gently as he folded me in his arms. He pressed a kiss to the top of my hair. I will strip away all that you know, all that you love, until you have no shelter but me. The most iconic toxic quote I have ever heard. <laughs> he will never write the books about the Morgovas, I know. Had the Darkling had friends like this, people whom he'd loved, who had fought for him and cared for him and made him laugh, people who had become little more than sacrifices to a dream that outlived them all. I would pay good money, good money, to just see them through the ages and what they have suffered. Wouldn't Maybe it wouldn't be the best, <laughs> because then I would feel even more for him than I already do. But as I already said... You are allowed to have a favorite character who ends up as a villain. That is the nuance of critical thinking. I'll take a little break before the final battle because I just, I, I need to, but I will be finishing it today. Yeah, it takes me two years to pick it back up and then I'll finish it in two days. That's just how it works, apparently. But the fact that in her acknowledgments, there's a whole separate section for Team Tumblr. <laughs> Tumblr was alive and thriving back then like all of the fan arts all of the incorrect quotes like i was living off red queen incorrect quotes and grishaverse fan arts back then it was it was everything i am kind of missing actually such uncomplicated and funny fandom content not the stupidly argumentative hilarity of shipping culture and just very toxic takes that's present right now in fandom culture like this this was the golden age and i that is also a hill i will die on we are back i am going to strive to finish this right now but <clears throat> i just wanted to say also i have like <sighs> tabbed it like a, li a little bit a little bit basically anytime the dark holes or bagra speak i haven't read the other two books obviously since 2021 and I think it's funny how in this whole trilogy, this one is so, is like, it's so much better than the other two that it's almost baffling to talk about. Like the last time I read it, to be fair, I ranted about book one the most, but that was because it had the most issues. Like looking back, book one is like a poorly written prologue to what this story is. Book two was better but there's too much Nikolai for my liking. And then this, this book is just perfection. Like genuinely perfection. This, I've read this for the third time since I was like 14 and it holds up. Like I just remember loving this so much more than the other two. And reading it right now, I can tell why. Like I can tell why everything that happens is something I'm interested in. All the characters that have to be likable are likable. It's sad. There's also a found family. There's character growth. The romances are progressing exactly as one would expect. There's so much more nuance than the other two. It's better written, not to mention. I think there's already like a prologue of Six of Crows get put in this. So she was probably writing Six of Crows at this point. And you can tell because the writing is so much, so much better. Now I didn't check and I'm not sure like how often these came out. Like if this was two years after Siege and Storm or one year or whatever. But it's just so much better than when anyone asked me. Like <laughs> I made a favorite book, favorite books video. That was the first video I ever made. And this is on the list. I would argue that only this book belongs on that list like not the entire trilogy i could reread this book as many times as it takes it would still be that good 
But I would never say that about the other two. I would never, ever say that about the other two. So it's a very odd trilogy, which is hilarious. Hilarious, because I know that everyone hates this one. And everyone hates this trilogy because of this one. But that's none of my business. <laughs> that's none of my business. I love this book so much. I will say one thing now that I'm on book three. This is the one where there's the most traveling and politicking and it matters where they are geographically. So why is this book the only one that doesn't have a map? Literally why? <laughs> like Six of Crows even has a map of all of the world and it's it doesn't even matter because they go to like two places. This really could have benefited from a map. I don't know if the other edition has one. It might but I luckily <laughs> I know that map very well. <laughs> very very well because I've read everything in this universe at least twice so I know the map also I just wanted to comment on this because it's like it's the last book it's the last time I'm going to comment on it but the darkling sister <laughs> I understand it's like a myth everything in the language of thorns is like a myth and legend but to shove in the fact that the darkling has a sister who's like a mythical creature in the Fjerdan Seas. Like, are you kidding? The fact that he has a random sister? Does that mean Bagra was with the merman? <laughs> I don't know, but that was such a batshit insane thing. I was reading Language of Thorns and then the Darkling shows up and he's like, I'm your brother. And I was like, absolutely baffled about how that could be such a throwaway thing in one of the random side plots, quests of a book about myths and fairy tales. That was arguably the best story though, so. <laughs> Alina, my queen and icon. She was hoping Mal would be taking her to the bedrooms. <laughs> and then he just brings her to a random room and she's like, uh, delightful. <laughs> we we love we love an honest queen who knows exactly what she wants. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I love her so much. I will go out on a limb here and say that Mal had the most development in this entire trilogy. <laughs> he is so self-aware, so self-aware at this point that it's almost funny. <laughs> Idiot. That fact is well established and adds nothing to the plot. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> I love him too. I. That's exactly my point. Good books make you love all of the characters. If not all of them, and then at least most of them. Like, at this point, I like even Zoya. I like even Zoya, and she's essentially a female Nikolai. Which makes me question why I actually like her. But she's a Grisha. That adds a lot to her character in this story. Nikolai is just a spoiled brat. But, <laughs> I like all of them. I like all of them. I love all of them. And it, I'm sorry, I just... I was thinking about it and that adds so much to this story so much to the stakes none of them die though so <laughs> so that's maybe not the best in terms of stakes but i love them let's for a minute this is going to be a long enough video anyway discuss the fact that alina's conjecture is very interesting what if she had been a grisha since she was a kid i have two things to contradict her theory one she would definitely be very close to the Darkling, like very close, because it would have been more creepy that way, because they would have known her since she was a child. But let's assume that she would would have been platonically close to him, like he probably would have been her mentor in some way, because she would be trained as his equal. So I know she's arguing that she wouldn't be as strong without the amplifiers, but if she would, had been honing her power since she was a kid she would definitely, under the tutelage of him and Bagra, she would have been very powerful with her own magic in, with her own summoning, yeah, let's use that term, in time. So she would have been very close to the Darkling as a mentor figure, as a friend, however you want to look at it. And also, if they were together for that long, his plans would have definitely been less extreme because he would have had what he wanted to have from the beginning. He definitely would have had her trust and her loyalty if they knew each other since she was a kid in whatever capacity he would have had her loyalty so they would have done whatever he wanted to do to the fold a long time ago so maybe she wouldn't even need the amplifiers like maybe she would need the amplifiers eventually when it was proven that he <laughs> 
he has lost his mind and that he's too drunk on the power he she would have maybe needed the amplifiers but i'm still arguing that she would have been very powerful on her own there also and again the point if they're both amplifiers like him and bagra i still think they should have been able to find the amplifiers through the centuries but that's another plot hole that i don't even want to address so i think if she was trained from childhood to be a sun summoner she would have been way more powerful and uh, i don't want to be very positive in my conjecture i don't but i do think the darkling and her would definitely be better off like he would be better off if he had someone like that who trusted him they could have actually done work on the fold and she would have been better off because she would have definitely been taught from the beginning so even if something did go wrong with the motosovas she could have been somewhat of a threat but it's still useless it's still useless to assume like this obviously from the perspective that we have right now but i think i think it still could have been interesting like an like an au about what would have happened if elena had left karamzin as a kid and this is what makes her the best protagonist i swear because the protagonists never ever 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 admit that they're as bad as the villain but they're not morally gray like jude it was something no other Grisha understood, and in the end, it was what bound me, me and the Darkling. Not our powers, not the strangeness of them, not that we were both aberrations, if not abominations. It was our knowledge of the forbidden, our desire for more. I am coming very close to his death. This, this is his death. <laughs> and it is not good. Like, I haven't handled his death very well in the past, but this time I feel like I'll be fine. Because I'm just not as emotionally invested if that makes sense like last time i was binging it but i don't know i just feel like as much as i was loving it i'm not as immersed as i would like to be and i don't know why that is but i'm not so i i should be fine this time around <laughs> maybe my favorite thing about it is how he's counting on her believing that he's hilariously cruel like it's literally his bet i guess that she would believe he's cruel and i love the intelligence of that so much but there you are hello alina where are the students they aren't here what did you do to them they're safe and sound back in kribirsk probably having their lunch <laughs> I knew the threat would be enough. Did you really believe I would endanger Grisha children when we'd had lost so many? <laughs> I know what you thought, what you've always thought of me. It's so much easier that way, isn't it? To puff yourself up with your own righteousness. <sighs> you did kill the teachers. You did kill the teachers. But it's so funny. <laughs> so funny. Because... And a little bit painful because through it all he kept true to what he had said he would never endanger grisha children because he's technically some methods aside the number one protector of the grisha and he's literally like i know what you thought i know what you think of me he said fine make me your villain so he used that and he used it successfully she planned all of this just to get the children to safety and he was like why would they be here? They're having their lunch. <sighs> I guess I'm just masking the fact that he's gonna die soon. <laughs> Which I can say I agree with it countless times. It still hurts every single time I read it. I'm not supposed to be tearing up. I'm not. But it's coming. <laughs> like, it's, it's coming. Because when the fold is being destroyed and how he's just looking around so stunned and so lost <laughs> and he looks at her and this this always hurt me this isn't right he said and in his voice i heard desperation a new and unfamiliar anguish his fingers skimmed my neck cuffed my face i felt no surge of surety no light stirred within me to answer his call his gray eyes searched mine confused nearly frightened you're meant to be like me you were meant you're nothing now 
He dropped his hands. I saw the realization hit him. Yeah, he was truly alone, and he always would be. See, this is what always gets me. <laughs> this is what always gets me. It's like, it's a sad ending. It's like, yes, you're meant to die because there's nothing else for you here. <laughs> there's literally nothing else for you here. That kind of gets me every time. <laughs> Like, I would have preferred him to be the generic villain here who just gets struck down. Because this hurt, this hurts extra. <laughs> I saw the emptiness enter his eyes, felt the yawning void inside him stretch wider, an infinite wasteland. The calm left him, all that cool certainty. He cried out in his rage. I hate it here. Um, I hate it here. <laughs> And he just keeps killing them. There was no bottom to the Darkling's pain. He would just keep falling and falling. And that's the the funny and sad ending that she gives him. <laughs> He's like, he made a soft sound when she stabs him. He made a soft sound, little more than an exaltation. He looked down at the hilt protruding from his chest, then back up at me. He frowned, took a step, tottered slightly. He righted himself. A single laugh burst from his lip, a lips. A fine spray of blood settled over his chin like this. <laughs> But you let it, like you let it. In your rage, you didn't even care to pay attention anymore. Like he died right then and there without her stabbing him because he realized he was alone and he always would be. And he was dead before she even did this. <laughs> the fact that even as he's dying, he's like, like this. This is how I'm going to go out. But there is no better way for you, Darkles. There is no better way for you, genuinely. <laughs> The Darkling's own power, Morozova's own blood. Blue sky, he said. I looked. In the distance, I saw it. Alina, he breathed. I knelt beside him. The nature of where I had left off their attacks. <sighs> Alina, the Darkling repeated, his fingers seeking mine. I was surprised to find fresh tears filling my eyes. And this is why I love her. This is why I love her. She killed him. She knew she had to. But she still cries for him. And that always breaks me. Breaks me so much. <laughs> I'm not crying that much. You have to give it to me. <laughs> he reached up and brushed his knuckles over the wetness on my cheek. The smallest smile touched his blood-stained lips. Someone to mourn me. <laughs> I am upset. I am upset. <laughs> I wasn't meant to be crying this time around. Like, I wasn't. <laughs> I could never read this, apparently, with a straight face. <laughs> He dropped his hand as if the weight were too much. No grave, he gasped, his hand tightening on mine for them to desecrate. All right. Once more, he said, speak my name once more. This was this was a quote that I had like on all my backgrounds back then. <laughs> he was ancient. I knew that. But in this moment, he was just a boy. Brilliant, blessed with too much power, burdened by eternity. Alexander. His eyes fluttered shut. Don't let me be alone, he murmured. And then he was gone. <laughs> Why were those your last words? <laughs> you couldn't have let your last words just be speak my name. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> like you were about to die. Did you have to do that to me? <sighs> Just for reference, this is in general my coping mechanism. I will die of laughter while I'm crying. This is this is my hope coping mechanism. This video has turned into a mess, but I'm sorry. You should be happy I have an emotional reaction to anything, considering I had none to the last two books. If you're still here at this point, congratulations. I am I am a mess. <laughs> I've composed myself a little bit, <laughs> little bit. <sighs> I will say two things. One, he got such a beautiful ending that I'm happy that through it all, 
Lee gave him such a beautiful ending. <laughs> like, even though she at times didn't know what to do with him, like, she made him very clever and then very childish the next second, and she made him a very, very chaotic villain. She gave him such a wonderful ending. Like, he appears all of three times in this book. I think if you count the visions as one thing, then there's when Bagra dies and this. He appears all of three times in this book. And she gave him such good dialogue and such a beautiful ending that even me, who loves him and thinks he should have died, is so heartbroken by his ending, but also very satisfied with his ending. Like, congratulations, Lee, on his ending. Genuinely, I think, of all of my characters, <laughs> fictional characters, that were wrongfully killed in their stories in a heartbreaking, gut-wrenching way, this one was fitting and beautiful at the same time. So congratulations to you on that. You are in the Hall of Fame for my fictional characters, who I love dearly. But they died properly so congratulations for that lee like it's beautiful and you gave him a main character who actually understood him understands him and still cries for his death and mourns him and takes his body to burn it along with her own letting him actually die with her and not dying alone dying with the equal dying with sancta alina who was his equal but she is also dead right when he is dead <sighs> It's wonderful. It is wonderful <laughs> and unmatched, genuinely, in terms of impactful villain deaths that I agree with, but are still making me sad. <laughs> Another thing that I think people will agree with, but I, I'm i surprised that I agree with them on this one thing. Mal should have stayed dead. <laughs> like, he should have stayed dead. That would have made the ending a little bit bittersweet. But it would have actually made the sacrifice impactful. Like she saved pretty much everyone by doing this. And it would have made the sacrifice very impactful. Like <laughs> the same way that Morozova kind of sacrificed himself and his daughter to create the third amplifier. I mean, yeah, she was brought back and stuff. But I still think it really, really could have been cool to be like to usher in this new era the last of the Morozova line has to die. Like, the last of the living amplifiers are dead. We can never hunt anyone down for their bones anymore. And I think that would have made it way more impactful. But at the same time, I am happy that Alina got her happy ending. Like, I am, because I love her. But I will agree with everyone. It would have made the sacrifice actually really poignant and important like what she had to give for all of this and i still think she could have find, found happiness not with nikolai <laughs> not with nikolai but i still think she could have just found happiness with herself otherwise with her friends or whatever they wouldn't have kicked her out just because she isn't a grisha anymore and <sighs> i'm rambling a bit but i know everyone hates that she loses her power and i hate that trope too However, here, much like the Darkling thing, I feel like it's all on purpose. Because technically her and the Darkling are the only Grisha above the other Grisha who can use Merzost and are corrupted by too much power. I think the whole point is that her power was borrowed just to rival his and to like shut it down. I don't think she was ever really Grisha, if that makes sense. She was just a vessel for something for the universe to right itself, to balance the scales. So I never minded her ending. It didn't feel like the trope, oh, a woman loses her power at the end of the book. Because it actually feels like a, like a realistic decision. Because no power like theirs is supposed to exist. Like, that's the entire message of her and the Darkling and Bagra's powers, that they're not supposed to exist and that they're only harm and suffering on the bearers. So I absolutely agree with the fact she should have lost her powers. But I do think Mal should have stayed dead. I will amend my statement a little. I think I think the point is that he didn't die. They like managed to resurrect him and Alina's sacrifice still stands because the point is she was rewarded by actually making the sacrifice. He doesn't have to really die for it. But 
I think he really should have died if she'd kept her magic. I think if she didn't keep her magic, then the ending is good if he lives because that way they can live together as they'd always wanted and that makes it better. <laughs> but I still think it would have been interesting to have him die. I guess that's all I'm saying. I do like the ending. I've always liked the ending and I've always been a minority, but it is what it is. I guess in the end, she came closest to understanding him, though. <laughs> I have to, I have to admit it. A cheer went up from the crowd as they're like tearing down his black flags and everything. I couldn't share in their excitement. For all his crimes, the Darkling had loved Ravka and he'd wanted its love in return. I am in pain. <laughs> I am in so much pain. Be lucky that I didn't read Demon of the Wood in the same vlog and that's like a two-year-old emotion because boy would I not have been okay. It's just such poetic beauty that they died together. No one knew his name to curse or extol, so I spoke it softly beneath my breath. Alexander, I whispered, a boy's name given up, almost forgotten. It's such a perfect ending. It's such a perfect ending. I, I feel like I have to praise Lee so much. Like, she used to be one of my favorites, and I feel like it's been years since she actually was, because I didn't have the best experience with books one or two. I will never read Crooked Kingdom again. I don't care about King of Scars. I'll never read Ninth House. This is like the one book where I can full-heartedly say, good job, Lee. Like, good job. It was so good. The fact that they got such a cool ending now, like, well, they had a kid and lived in the countryside. It's like they rebuilt the orphanage. They took Misha with them and they, like, took care of the kids and everything. So they kind of had kids, but not really. And she was drawing and tell telling stories. And, like, the fact that Nikolai and all the Grisha still kept visiting. It's not like they never saw each other again. And they gave her a kefta. <sighs> it's just so cool. It's literally so cool. It's such a sweet ending that feels so lovely to read about. I think we also need to acknowledge that they both lost things. Like neither of them feels completely whole anymore. And they're together and they love each other. And that's all that they need. <laughs> I feel a little bit empty. Like I didn't feel like this after the first two books. I know I didn't. They didn't mean that much to me. But this was just a delight. Like a beginning to end, a delight. Even though a lot of it is action and battles and conflict, it's so good. Like the fact that I didn't even miss, miss the Darkling and there wasn't that much of him in this just proves how good the book is. Like I was happy to spend my time with Alina, Mal, and the others. I just loved all of it. I loved all of it. I have no complaints aside from like the couple complaints I had throughout like right now after I finished it in terms of the emotion you get when you feel when you finish a book like if you're left satisfied or unsatisfied I have nothing to add nothing to add I am so happy that this book holds up so well after all of these years and that I still love it so much I was scared to read it because I was rereading I was rereading this entire trilogy when the show was coming out and I was so scared it wouldn't hold up and it did and I'm so happy it did because <laughs> I do remember it being this way that like books one and two were fine very young young adult but this is where it gets real good and this is where it actually stands among my favorite books of all time and for <laughs> and for good reason I love this book and I'm very happy that I still love this book. And I'm very happy when things I used to love hold up. Now, I've talked long enough. This vlog trilogy is now complete. I've finished my Grisha trilogy reread and huge rant. I even cried like twice in this video. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed. And I hope you enjoyed finally having a very positive vlog about this story so I will leave you here and 
just breathe in and be very happy that I read this and I was this happy with it in a way and this is I think the last thing that I will say before I leave you I'm happy I cried because for the things that I love if there's a moment that like personally resonated with me if it doesn't hit the same the next time that I reread it I don't think it holds up so if I hadn't cried when the darkling died I almost feel like I would have betrayed myself because it would have been like you didn't react to this moment that you reacted to the last two times so it's almost like you don't care so I'm kind of happy that it still strikes me in the exact same way like the exact same lines still hurt the same as they hurt me back then and that means it holds up that means that the emotion is still there so I am a little bit grateful that I did actually react the way I did it just proves that it's still as good as it was to me back then so I will see you in the next video whatever it is I'll try and not bother you with too many vlogs but like calls to like and that's apparently me in vlogs so I'll see you in the next video scratch that there was one thing I was reading her interviews at the end of the book because there are interviews in the other edition <sighs> I hate how both the editions aren't the same there was one thing I just had to add when she asked when she's asked what she loves about the three love interests she's like competence I love that they're all really good at what they do <laughs> and honestly I, I agree I agree I hate incompetent love interests men in general but